I will go ahead and get started this afternoon. Welcome to the uh, McElhaney Lecture Series for 2016. This will be your last lecture in this series, and we have a new lecture starting in January. I'm Richard Layton. I'm president of the NGWA REF Foundation, who sponsors this uh, um, lecture series along with the Darcy Lecture Series. And today, I would like to welcome um, Diane Scott of Franklin Electric, our main benefactor for the McElhaney Lecture Series. Franklin has been a long tenured sponsor of this McElhaney Lecture Series, and we really do appreciate your support. It has made a difference in us being able to uh, provide education throughout the world. We especially want to thank Diane, who in her years with the company has been an avid supporter herself of our initiatives, and our initiatives being the education side of things. She is an experienced marketing executive with a proven track record of accomplishments in leading companies into new market categories and bringing cross-functional managers together to develop innovative new products. With that, I want to welcome Diane. Welcome, everyone. Uh, to this amazing experience that I am really personally very proud to be part of, known as the McElhaney Lecture Series. As he said, my name is Diane Scott, and I am the Vice President of Marketing for Franklin Electric. We are a leading manufacturer of, of pumps, motors, drives, and controls, and if you haven't been on the show floor yet, please come visit us at booth 357. Um, our reason for underwriting the McElhaney Lecture Series is really quite simple. At Franklin, we pride ourselves in educating the industry because we know that the knowledgeable, having knowledgeable contractors and distributors will only help equate to smarter use and application of our technologies to advance your craft. Our product line is very diverse and offers many, many opportunities for many of you in this room. And additionally, we feel personally that this is one of the best educational resources available today. So on behalf of Franklin Electric, I'm very proud to introduce our 2016 McElhaney lecturer, Peter S. Cartwright. Peter entered the water purification and wastewater treatment industry in 1974 and has had his own consulting engineering firm since 1980. He is a technical consultant that has provided services to more than 250 clients globally. Uh, Cartwright has authored approximately 200 articles written several book chapters, and I understand one you put on hold for the last year, uh, presented more than 200 lectures and conferences around the world, and is a recipient of a number of patents. He truly is a legend in our industry. So Peter, it's my distinct honor to award you this presentation of our appreciation as our McElhaney Lecture Series. So thank you, Diane. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. So without further ado, please welcome Peter and his presentation entitled Groundwater Contaminants and Treatment Technologies. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Diane. <clears throat> to start with, a little bit of logistical stuff. I'm probably going to step down there because I'm one of these people that I uh, can I may not be able to walk and chew, run and chew gum, but I can walk and talk at the same time. And um, this is going to be very casual, if I can. Uh, there's a rather large crowd, for which I appreciate. Um, but uh, being an old guy, I have a fantastic memory. It's just extremely short. So if you have a question, uh, or a comment, please interrupt me uh, uh, as I'm talking, and we'll address it. And uh, secondly, um, there are uh, some uh, sheets of 8.5 by 11 paper that with my contact information, a little bit of background on me. I believe they're on the chair right outside the door. I also have a quantity of business cards. and. Uh, if there is ever a question that I can answer, either with a quick email or over the phone, uh, please feel free to contact me. Uh, if, if it's something that, that doesn't take a lot of effort on my part, uh, there's no charge. Uh, I like to brag that I'm not an attorney. I don't turn on the meter when the phone rings. 
Uh, on the other hand, um, I may not always be able to answer a question, but at my age, I may not know the answer, but I usually know where to go to get it. So uh, as Diane said, the lecture is going to be on groundwater contaminants. And uh, one of the reasons I have to step on the floor is I have to see what I have up here in the way of slides. But this is my information. And uh, I've had a great experience this last year, given, I don't know, maybe 35 lectures um, as far away as Valencia, Spain, and as close as uh, St. Cloud, Minnesota, only about 50 miles from my home. Um, and I got a chance to talk about many, many groundwater contaminants. Now, we have, uh, NGWA has 13 what they call BSP, Best Suggested Practices Documents. Each one is devoted to uh, a particular contaminant. And if I were to talk about all 13, along with the treatment technologies for each of them, uh, and maybe a little bit of background as to how the treatment technologies work, uh, it would be a six or eight hour lecture guaranteed to put every one of you to sleep. So what I've had to do is, is tailor the presentation to whatever the contaminants were that were of interest to the group I was talking to. Today I'm going to take a bit of a deviation and we'll proceed. Before I get into what I want to talk about, let me tell you what I've learned this year. I've had a great experience. I met lots of people um, and uh, made a lot of what I hope are new friends um, and done a lot of traveling, as you can imagine. Now, what I know about well water treatment is um, what I've learned is that maybe bentonite has more uses than just cat litter. And about water well drilling. Those of you who have, uh, have uh, heard me talk before may have seen these slides. I keep showing them because I, I, I think they're great. I got them from a regulator in Utah uh, early on in, my, uh, in this year. <laughs> At least I've learned that's not the way to uh, uh, keep track of your tools. Uh, this is probably what would happen if I tried to drill a well. Or this. Now these next three slides I think are very humorous. I'll have to give you time to read them. But uh, there are some uh, specifications. I hope those of you in the back of the room can read them. The fifth one, I think, is particularly humorous. The OD of, the, of all pipe shall exceed the ID. Otherwise, the hole will be on the outside. <laughs> uh, all pipe is to be supplied without rust, as this can be applied at this job site. And then you got some more. And last but not least, I can't be attributed to these quotes, so if, uh, if you want to beat somebody about the head and shoulders, uh, it's not me. All right, let's get into the crux of the issue. What else have I learned? Groundwater treatment is extremely complex, challenging, but fascinating. Uh, before I got into this particular activity, I had naively thought that groundwater was pristine, it wasn't contaminated with anything, it was uh, 
uh, the purest water in the world, et cetera, et cetera. Well, guess what? It's not. And in particular, I want to talk the rest of the time about PPCPs. PPCPs are, are the term used for personal, pharmaceutical and personal care products. Every time you wash your hands, every time you take a shower, every time you launder clothes, every time water goes down the drain, it contains some contaminants that you as a human being have placed into this water. And uh, I'm not an expert on, on ph the pharmaceutical processing within the human body, except to say that, that apparently uh, a great percentage of any pharmaceutical products you take are not metabolized and they come out mainly in your urine and that is contaminating somebody's drinking water supplies downstream uh, or contaminating a well. The discarded pharmaceutical products, the, the industry is looking very closely at that now, the pharmaceutical manufacturing industry, and they're taking great care. They are no longer supposedly taking their pharmaceutical products that are discarded and flushing them down the sewer. They're being treated otherwise, but uh, supposedly. Cosmetics. Uh, and I just recently read yesterday about uh, an issue with regard to what they call nanoparticles. These are not chemicals, at least they're not chemicals that are in solution like the PPCPs are. These are uh, tiny particles that are put in cosmetics and other uh, products that we use. Uh, I saw a, an indication, um, somebody had done some studies and they said, a normal batch of clothes that are washed in your dishwasher can release as many as 300,000 nanoparticles into the water, which ends up in our drinking water. Now, most of these chemicals that, com that comprise the PPCPs, and, and uh, one, of, one set of chemicals are called EDC, uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals, um, most of them are organics. For those of you who understand chemistry enough to distinguish between inorganic and organic, most of them are organic compounds. They're not ionized, but uh, that also creates treatment product, uh, problems. Now, the, some organic chemicals are biodegradable. Uh, most of the sewage that we talk about or that we consider sewage those are biodegradable. That means if you, if you allow uh, anything, any water body to stand stagnant, bacteria, naturally occurring bacteria will, will break down these, those particular categories of organic chemicals that are called biodegradable. No problem. That's what our sewage treatment plants do. It's the other things that are not biodegradable that, that are the subject of this discussion. Uh, these are also known, these, these chemicals I'm talking about are also known as environmental persistent pharmaceutical products, EPPPs, or contaminants of emerging concern, CECs, or endocrine disruptors. They're all acronyms for the same thing. These are organic compounds that are in the water uh, that we are drinking every day. There are as many as 80,000 that they've identified or that they suspect are in there. And they're virtually all human made. They're artificially manufactured in our processing. And these chemicals are accumulating. Why are they accumulating? Because we've got a, a certain quantity on, of water on this earth that's been the same volume, same quantity for millions of years. We've got more and more people that are contaminating it. That's the reason why the concentrations are increasing. Now, the question is, do these concentrations that are present in our water supplies 
do they have a health, a health effect? Are they dangerous? And are, they are, they, are the concentrations increasing? Well, as I said, they are increasing, but just because we have a greater population. And uh, in the developed world, the, the uh, level of standard of living is going up, and uh, more and more people are ac accessing uh, chemicals that they're using for everyday purposes. But the, the big question is, do the current concentrations have any effect on human health? Right now, and the reason that, that, that you may have heard about this, but you've never heard that, it, that it's regulated, is because we don't know yet. There are many, many studies underway that are examining this. And they're not regulated by the EPA. Why? Because they have not established a risk. But I, I will stand here and say unequiv unequivocally that there, is a, there will be a risk assigned. I'm absolutely convinced that these chemicals will, because there's so many different kinds, some of them even are capable of reacting with each other in the water, uh, I think they are ultimately going to find uh, a risk. The U.S. is the largest pill-popping nation in the world. 70% of us take one prescription drug a day, 50% two prescription drugs a day, 25% five-plus prescription drugs a day. They claim, the, the, when they've done this, these investigations of these PPCPs in water and measured them, they claim that you can go downstream of any major population center and determine what the illegal drug of choice is in that area, heroin, cocaine, et cetera. With regard to prescriptions between 1999 and 20, 2009, the, the annual prescriptions increased from two to almost double four billion prescriptions a year. The, the endocrine disrupting chemicals, this is just a uh, definition, but it's just one of the classes of chemicals they've found. And the typical homeowner uses 12 products per day in their normal activity that go end up going down the drain. That's 168 different chemicals. Cleaning, you wash your hands. Now, uh, the good news is most detergents and soaps are biodegradable, but there's an awful lot of it. You've probably heard of tri triclosan, the so-called uh, antimicrobial ingredient in soap. It's one of these chemicals. And you don't need it, I might add. Uh, I'm absolutely convinced you don't need to buy antimicrobial soap. Soap alone is, is as good as you can get. Here is the, here is the uh, description of that. Uh, it's also, which I didn't even realize, you can find it in to toothpaste. So we're actually, at least those of us who are ingesting some toothpaste, you end up uh, consuming triclosan. And it'll break down into an endocrine disrupting compound, and it, it can break down into dioxin, one of the most dangerous of all human-made drug uh, chemicals. This is a product that is used, uh, as you well know, uh, we have an awful lot of addiction issues in this country, uh, both uh, from the illegal drugs as well as from uh, opiates and uh, various uh, legal prescription drugs that are abused. Um, and uh, methadone is one of the products that's used to, to uh, minimize uh, the dependency uh, with uh, drugs. And uh, it produces a, a, what's called NDMA. It's a carcinogen, and it poorly degrades in the environment. That's the problem. If it doesn't degrade, it's not biodegradable. And most of these chemicals are not biodegradable or not completely biodegradable. Uh, we, I'm on a task force here at NG, NGWA on the uh, perfluorinated compounds. Uh, they're called PFCs here. Uh, within, the, within the organization, we call them PFOAs. Um, 
And these are, are uh, Teflon, uh, fire foam, full of polyfluorinated compounds. Fluorine is a very, very stable element, very difficult to, to degrade. And now they feel that it's, uh, it will undoubtedly be on the primary drinking water list. Our water is, contains it. Uh, they, I talked about the nanofibers and fabric finishes, antifouling paints, uh, degradation byproducts. These are actually particles, not, not uh, soluble chemicals. Now this, I'll go through this pretty fast because it just is a list of, of all of these complex organics and it's just a few of them. Keep in mind there are as many as 80,000. But this gives you an idea, you may recognize things like DDT here, uh, Deldrin, Aldrin, Endrin, uh, various pesticides and herbicides. Uh, and this is where you, your groundwater can become contaminated because of the agricultural practices. And keep in mind, this is not done by people that are purposely trying to contaminate the environment. There are people that don't know better. Uh, in the past, I, I, I use this as an example, in, in a suburb of where I live in Minneapolis, uh, there is a suburb there that uh, their, their entire groundwater, municipal groundwater system is being run through activated carbon because back in World War II, there was an ammunition factory in this suburb. And in those days, the way they got rid of such solvents as trichloroethane was to bury it in the ground. They thought it was okay. Guess what? It ain't. And their entire drinking water supply for that, for the, actually there are two communities up there in uh, northern Minneapolis. Uh, and uh, their, their entire supply is contaminated with TCE. Now, fortunately, activated carbon takes it out very well, but the entire drinking water uh, system it has to be filtered with uh, activated carbon. So a lot of this stuff is not done uh, with intention. It's done out of ignorance. Here's another list, yet another list. Now. What are the concentrations in there? They're in parts per trillion. Part per trillion is equivalent to one second in 32,000 years. It's, it's not that, that this is a new issue. It's only been recently we've had the technology that was able to measure the concentration of contaminants at that level. Very, very small. It's also equivalent to a six inch leap in a journey to the sun or a pinch of salt and 10,000 tons of potato chips. I didn't do these, I did, I did double check this one, but that's the only one that I could. So again, are any of these compounds in these tiny concentrations a risk? And I say yes. It's just a matter of time before the, uh, all of the uh, academic and research organizations that are looking into this comes to this conclusion. I, but I personally am absolutely convinced of this. So I say yes, they are a looming health issue. Now, what are some, what's some of the uh, anecdotal evidence? In the last 30 years, the birth rate for males has declined every year. In 20 industrialized countries, three, fi three million fewer boys are born. Reproductive organ abnormalities increased 200% over the last 20 years. 85% of the sperm DNA in healthy males is damaged. There is a 300% increase in testicular cancer. Now the question is, is this because we're doing a better job of monitoring these uh, I issues, or is it really getting worse? Uh, there are some people that say the increased uh, uh, rate of autism and other uh, mental issues might be related to the environment. Is it the water we drink? Is it the air we breathe? Is it contaminants in the food we eat? We don't know yet, but I think there's pretty strong evidence. So many studies are underway. No link has been identified yet. 
But in my opinion, it's only a matter of time. There's a lot of issues that have to be determined. The long-term effects of exposure, the new chemicals resu resulting from the mixtures, because these chemicals can react with each other in some cases. And keep in mind that all of the primary drinking water standards established by the EPA are the, the limits, like the 10 parts per billion uh, limit for arsenic, for example. These are designed to protect the immunocompromised. We've got a lot of immunocompromised people in this country, and the percentage is growing all the time. It's the very old, the very young, the people that are suffering from uh, some sort of uh, debilitating disease like diabetes or something, uh, transplant patients, HIV uh, people, uh, all sorts of people whose, immuno, whose immune system has been compromised. And the standards are written to protect those people. Now, what can we do about it? Well, number one, there is no single treatment technology that will be completely effective. What's called, and the EPA is already using that in, in other issues, they call it a multi-barrier approach. Use more than one technology to ensure that you are removing the percentage that you desire to remove. The, the issue is not that you can remove all of anything. That's impossible. The, the goal is to remove what the risk assessment people, the toxicologists, have determined to be a safe level, or uh, remove these down to a safe level. Now, there is some removal of these, and keep in mind that, uh, that most of, this, of these contaminants end up in the sewage, uh, which ultimately becomes somebody's drinking water, of course. But for municipal wastewater treatment, there is some uh, removal from the anaerobic sludge digestion. In other words, this is, uh, ends up in the sludge. Or sorption. Uh, the, some of these chemicals can be absorbed into a sludge. The, the, the solids that result from a uh, municipal wastewater treatment plant uh, will soak up some of these chemicals. Now, the trouble is if, they, if you apply it to an agricultural application, like land application or something, then they'll dissolve and go right down into the uh, groundwater. Now, the two technologies that I'm going to talk about, uh, one of them is activated carbon. Activated carbon is an excellent treatment technology. It's been around for many years. It has the ability to remove low molecular weight organic contaminants. So it's, it's, it's an excellent treatment technology. What is activated carbon? It's one of the surface active technologies, and I've given lectures uh, uh, this year on, uh, for example, removal of radon, hydrogen sulfide, uh, uh, and th these are both accomplished with activated carbon as well as um, using ac surface active technologies for things like uh, arsenic removal, et cetera. Activated carbon utilizes a technology or a mechanism known as adsorption, AD. It's a surface active. Those of you who have seen this slide before will recognize it. Absorption uh, is when a substance penetrates into it like a sponge. A spon sponge absorbs water or contaminants. But the, the main function of the activated carbon is adsorption. And here's an example of the two. Adsorption is a surface phenomenon. Absorption goes down into the body of the uh, product. This is a good uh, illustration. The, the, the surface area of activated carbon, what makes it functional is the fact that it's got an extremely high surface area. If you read some of the advertising literature from the uh, various activated carbon manufacturers will say one teaspoon of this uh, product 
will have as much surface area as X number of football fields. And it does have an extremely high surface area. And within this surface area, within the pores in this activated carbon particle, it can adsorb, with a D, large organics, illustrated here, or low molecular weight organics like solvents. Does a very good job on, on certain solvents. And they could be uh, airborne as well as waterborne. Carbon is typically manufactured from either petroleum products, what they call it bituminous sources, lignite, which is a byproduct from the manufacturing of pulp and paper, just plain old wood that's been specially treated. That you, you can't take activated carbon and burn it, or you can't make activated carbon by, by burning wood. It has to be manufactured under very controlled conditions. But uh, coconut shell is also a, a source. It's one of the better sources uh, in terms of, of manufacturing uh, a very efficient activated carbon product. A relatively new product in the, in the field now is what are called carbon block devices. These are actually filters that are made from granular activated carbon, these particles that are bonded together with an adhesive to form a filter. The advantage that has is that it also will serve as a sediment filter. You can get activated carbon block products that have submicron filtration, half micron, for example. So you can filter sediment as well as adsorb solvents and, and other uh, organic contaminants. Now, the other technology that, that I feel is appropriate for this right now, the technology we have in our uh, arrow of quiver, quiver of arrows, I should say, uh, is, is membrane technology. And that's really, uh, to talk about that, I have to kind of get into some definitional terms. Uh, these four technologies, microfiltration, ultrafiltration, nanofiltration, and reverse osmosis, are technically defined as cross-flow, pressure-driven membrane separation technologies. Uh, they're kind of close to my heart because I've been in this, in this particular field for 42 years. Now, in particular, when you're dealing with these PPCPs, the ones of particular interest is reverse osmosis or nanofiltration, either one of them. But the one, of, uh, the, the, the one technology that is the principal removal technology is reverse osmosis because that will remove organics. It will filter out organics with a molecular weight as low as about 100 the, the chemists call them Daltons, but a, a, any organic molecule with a molecular weight uh, above 100 is going to be filtered by. The pure membrologists don't like the, the term filtration, but it really is. It's molecular filtration. This is something that's in solution that can be filtered out or removed with reverse osmosis. So how does it work? If you take water and you run it between two layers of membrane, and this water is under pressure because the only energy use to accomplish this separation is pressure. As I said, these are cross-flow pressure-driven. Cross-flow means you're running the, the feed stream, the water stream, whatever you want to treat, you're running it across the surface and it's under pressure. The pressure is the driving force, and the cross flow makes it a continuous process. And what you do is you take a percentage of the water that's in this stream, not the entire solution, just the water portion of it, and you're forcing that through the membrane. You're filtering the water with it. And microfiltration, by definition, is the removal of suspended solids only. You use a, a membrane, the water goes through, the salts go through. The salts are the, are the ionic contaminants, like sodium chloride or whatever. 
macromolecules is a chemist's term for dissolved organics. So you've got two kinds of solute. You have ionic solute and you have organic solute. And uh, they will both go through a microfilter. So this isn't going to work for removing PPCPs. But the dirt, suspended solids, will. This might be required for pretreatment, for example. Microfiltration is the removal of suspended solids only. The pore sizes are in the submicron range. They're less than one micron. And the removal mechanism is sieving. What's too big to go through ain't going to go through the membrane, period. Ultrafiltration, by definition, is, uses, in many cases, exactly the same membrane material that's an organic polymer. but. The pore size is smaller. It's made in the manufacturing process to be a smaller pore size. So it's small enough to hold back these organics. So theoretically, you could remove PPCPs with ultrafiltration. The problem is the, the pores are bigger than the other technologies we'll talk about. But so ultrafiltration will remove suspended solids and some dissolved organics. So it's dissolved organic or macromolecule removal. The pore sizes are in the submicron range also, but they're generally smaller than MF. That's why they will remove some of these uh, high molecular weight organics. And the removal mechanism is sieving again. What's too big to go through, the pore ain't going to go through. Now to talk about nanofiltration and reverse osmosis, you have to understand what osmosis is. Osmosis is, and this is a natural biological phenomenon. We could not exist as living beings if it weren't for osmosis. Trees could not survive, or plants even, could not survive with, without osmosis because that is how water is transported through cell walls, for example. And what it is is the movement of water from a relatively pure solution. This could be tap water, this could be seawater. You'll get water moving through just by osmotic pressure, by the, the phenomenon of osmosis, moving from the pure water side to the impure water side. This is a higher energy state. The purer the water is, the higher its energy state. And nature wants to e equalize this. So what will happen is you'll get water only moving through from the pure water side to the impure water side, or dirty water side, whatever you want to call it. And it will actually increase the level of, of water on the impure water side because it wants to equalize the energy. So if you take this and you feed water in, this is dirty water, if you feed it in, in a reverse direction, with a high enough pressure, you will overcome the natural osmotic pressure of osmosis, and you will purify water. This is how reverse osmosis works. The reason it's called reverse osmosis is because it's the natural phenomenon of osmosis in reverse. By the way, you know, if anybody has a question, let me hear from you. Now, to use the same analogy, if here's the membrane, we got water passing through, but now salts are held back, macromolecules are held back, suspended solids. Theoretically, everything is held back in reverse osmosis. In nanofiltration, this is a form of reverse osmosis, but it's, a, it's what we call loose osmosis. It, the membranes are such that they uh, will allow certain particular salts to go through. These are salts, and I apologize for the chemistry here, but every salt, every ionic compound has a valence. A valence is the number of charges it has on it. Sodium, for example, as in sodium chloride, sodium has a valence of one. Chloride has a valence of one. Calcium has a valence of two. Aluminum has a valence of three. Phosphate has a valence of three. Whether it's positive or negative doesn't make any difference. What nanofiltration does, it distinguishes between the valence. The higher the valence, the more it's rejected. 
And the lower the valence, the more likely it is to go through a nanofilter. So by definition, NF for nanofiltration rejects salts as with RO, but it rejects the multivalent, the, the, the salts with a higher valence, a higher charge, to a much higher degree than monovalent salts. So if you take all four of these technologies and relate them to each other, microfiltration will remove suspended solids, ultrafiltration will remove dissolved organics, nanofiltration will remove the multivalent salts, and reverse osmosis will theoretically remove everything, in theory. Now, what I want to talk about here is what I consider to be the solution that's in everybody's grasp to protect yourself from the PPCPs. And that is a standard under sink reverse osmosis system. I think everybody in this room has heard about a reverse osmosis system you can buy at a DIY store or from your Culligan dealer or whatever. These things are as good as anything you can get to protect yourself from the PPCP contamination. And because they're so easily available, you can go to Home Depot and spend less than $200. You can get a unit, a system made by General Electric, as good as anything in the market. If you're not that handy with installing, and I can't imagine there's a single well driller in the room that, that, that can't install these. But uh, you, can, you can contact your water conditioning dealer. Virtually all of the water conditioning dealers in this country sell reverse osmosis systems. They will be happy to install one for you for a price. But what it basically consists of is a pressure tank to absorb the water that's been manufactured by reverse osmosis. It's got pre-filters here that, that, that remove the sediment from the water. And if you've got groundwater, you probably don't have a lot of sediment. Um, uh, a carbon filter to remove the chlorine, but that is what removes a, a large portion of these PPCPs. And then, of course, the reverse osmosis membrane that, that removes the high molecular weight organics. The, the wonderful thing about this is that the low molecular weight organics are basically removed with activated carbon. The high molecular weight organics are removed with uh, reverse osmosis. So you've got a double barrel, or what you could say a multi-barrier approach to protect yourself. They may have a carbon pre-filter, uh, carbon post-filter here. Um, they've got an automatic shutoff. Uh, let me talk just a minute about uh, what I've heard in the industry uh, uh, as far as the, the disadvantages with reverse osmosis. And I will argue with anybody who wants to tell me that I'm wrong, uh, but because I'm doing the lecturing, I'm always right, of course. But number one, they say, you need the minerals from the water to maintain good health. Now, with a smaller group, I would probably use more colorful language, but that is not true. If you are on a normal diet, you get more minerals than your body can use anyway. Part of the PPCPs that are going into the sewer are minerals that, you, that your body doesn't need. You don't need water to supply minerals. That's number one. Number two, the people who sell carbon filters, maybe, or don't sell reverse osmosis systems are going to say, oh, that water's too pure. It's going to extract stuff from your body. It'll kill you. That is equally untrue. Uh, and I'll give you a good example. The, the, the quality of water from a reverse osmosis system, uh, which is mainly measured by the conductivity of water, and the conductivity of water is produced by the salts you have in it, not the organics. But the higher the salts concentration, the greater its conductivity, the greater it will, uh, it will conduct electricity. They say, theoretically, the, well, let me back up. The highest purity of water you can get uh, from an industrial standpoint is what's called 18 megohm, 18 million ohm resistance water. Well, you measure water by either measuring its conductivity or its resistance. Resistance is the reciprocal of conductivity, 
And the higher the purity of water, the lower its conductivity. So to make it more easily talked about, what they do is they use the inverse. They, they talk about resistivity. The highest purity of water is uh, 18 million ohm resistance. That's equivalent to like 0 0.0005 uh, uh, micro siemens, which is conductivity. Anyway, uh, they claim that you could fill your bathtub with 18 mega ohm water. You could get into your bathtub, plug in a hair dryer, and immerse it in the water. You would not be electrocuted. I don't say try this at home. But this is true. It's the conductivity. It's the salts concentration that affects the conductivity. It's the conductivity in water that will kill you. So having said that, uh, the, 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 a, an equivalent to conductivity is what's called TDS, total dissolved solids. And most of the industry, when they talk about salts concentration, they talk about TDS. But anyway, um, what a reverse osmosis system will do will remove about 95% of the salts in the water. And if you say a typical water analysis, if there is such a thing in the United States, let's say is about 300 microsiemens, or let's say 300 parts per million total dissolved solids. That's a very, uh, here in, in uh, Vegas, it's, it's closer to eight or 900. But at any rate, uh, that's why probably a lot of you who, who deign to drink uh, uh, tap water have probably, can probably taste it. But at any rate, if you were to take 300 parts per million tap water and you would run it through a reverse osmosis system, the permeate, the treated water, would have a, uh, a total dissolved solids concentration of about 15. So you take it from 300, you would purify it down to, let's say, 15. Now that's about as good as you can get as far as the quality of water. It, it would have almost all of the, the, the uh, PPCPs removed too. But those, you can't measure those readily. You can measure the performance of your reverse osmosis system by just electrical conductivity by these little, uh, TD, what they call TDS meters. Anyway, 15 parts per million is about as good as you can get, typically. You can go to Vancouver, BC, and the tap water there is about 10 parts per million. How many people in Vancouver, BC are dying because of the purity of the water? So again, that's just not true. So two things have been discounted. One is the fact that you need the minerals, which you don't, and the fact that this water is too pure, it's going to extract uh, minerals from your body. Now, having said that, the one, quote, downside of reverse osmosis is that you've taken the chlorine out because these membranes will not work. They will be destroyed by chlorine in the water. So you have to use activated carbon that takes out the chlorine, takes out some of the PPCPs. In doing so, the water standing in your tank is unchlorinated. It'll be full of bacteria, maybe 10 times higher concentration than your tap water. Do you worry about it? No, because it's what's called heterotrophic plate count, HPC bacteria. We could not live if we were not full of bacteria as humans or as animals even. Um, they claim that there's more bacteria in your body than blood cells. We need bacteria to exist as, as living beings. It's only the tiny concentrations of, of uh, bacteria that are pathogenic, that are dangerous to your health. You will not get pathogenic bacteria in, in your RO unit unless somebody's contaminated with a disease. So the bacteria that's in your drinking water, you can't taste, you can't smell, you can't see. It's harmless. But there will be more bacteria in your water. Is that a problem? In my opinion, absolutely not. The advantages of this technology for removing this, what I consider to be the, the, the major looming drinking water issue, drinking water quality issue facing us as humans, uh, I think the advantages of this 
inexpensive treatment technology um, greatly outweigh the fact that it's full of bacteria. Having said that, uh, I would also say, and, and I don't want to step on anybody's toes, but when you drink bottled water, and much of our population does, number one, you're not sure where that water's coming from. If you read the label, and if it says it's made by reverse osmosis, you may be safe. But you, by, by law, the bottled water industry does not have to treat the water at all. All it has to do is meet the EPA drinking water standards. It doesn't have to be any better than the water coming out of your tap. Now, I don't want to insult the International Bottled Water Association. However, I will stand here and say it's a hell of a waste of money to, to drink bottled water. You are contaminating the hell out of the environment with all these bottles that end up on the street unless you're in California or, for example, in the Netherlands, every time you buy a bottle, you're paying a deposit. But uh, I, I am more concerned about the solid waste contamination we're doing to our environment by the bottles. There are some people that say that every year, just in the United States alone, oh, we throw enough, away enough bottled waters to circle the earth two or three times. I mean, it just, um, it's ridiculous. And for the people who need to have bottled water, I'm saying get yourself an RO unit, get a stainless steel bottle, a reusable bottle, fill it up every morning before you go to work. Now, if you drink more than one bottle a day, uh, you know, that may be an issue. You may have to put the arm on your people at work to put in an RO unit. But at any rate, uh, this is, in my opinion, the solution. The water you are getting out of your reverse osmosis unit is the safest water you can get. And it's your water. You have control over the technology. Yes, sir? How about distilled water? Distilled water, the question is. Uh, distillation is, a, is also an excellent, I mean, in terms of safety, it's as good. And somebody might argue it's even better than RO water. The disadvantage with distilled water is, number one, it's expensive because it's probably not as uh, energy efficient because you have to evaporate the water and then condense it. So you put in a lot of energy to make it. And number two, uh, one of the things that makes water taste good is dissolved oxygen or dissolved air. Uh, taste is a very, very subjective issue. But um, the trouble with distillation is that, is that all the air is removed. With our own, air goes through the membrane. So they, a lot of people complain that distilled water tastes flat, whatever that is. So it, it will change the taste more than RO will. But in terms of efficacy, in terms of safety, it's as good as RO. It's just that, that because reverse osmosis is so inexpensive today that I, in my experience, I see very few distillers that are being sold. But, but there's nothing wrong with the technology. Any other questions before I proceed? And I'm sorry for this soapbox lecture, lecture, but I feel very strongly about this. I think that, 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 that uh, uh, the point is it's going to be a looming issue, and we have a solution. It, it, it's not going to remove 100% of these contaminants, but it's going to remove an awful lot of them. And we have it right at our fingertips. Now. For a normal point of use, reverse osmosis system, you should use softened water. If you're in a hard water area that requires soft water or that you want soft water, uh, then it, you should use softened water because that protects the membrane. Um, the, the, the unit will have a sediment filter built into it. And of course, as I said already, you want to remove the chlorine with activated carbon because that protects the membrane. And it's also going to remove the PPCPs. Now, one of the things that, that we haven't done anything with yet, or we haven't, uh, let's say, arrived. Yes, sir? Uh, but I think part of the issue with the technology, aren't you putting the burden on the citizen that the person, the, the, the provider and the public, and basically as a society, we have to okay for us to contaminate groundwater and then we have it in the pocket? Uh, the question is uh, the responsibility. 
And on a, from a moral standpoint, no. From a practical standpoint, that's the way it is. You know, as they say nowadays, it is what it is. In our normal activity as human beings in a developed society, we are contaminating the hell out of the water, period. I mean, how many people are going to quit using soap or quit using uh, the products they're using for cosmetics and stuff, deodorant, whatever you want to call it, how many of us are going to quit using them knowing that we're contaminating the water? Now, having said that, I'm going to turn it around a little bit and say, I don't think the responsibility is, is, is with the municipal treatment plant. There is no way in hell that we can afford to put in reverse osmosis and activated carbon with all of our, the water that comes out of our drinking water plants. And having said that, it's really stupid to, to, to treat water to that extent, to pay the money to treat water so that it has a minimal PPCP concentration when we only drink 1% of it. You know, I think it's a tragedy that we're using this high purity water to flush toilets with. Come on. I mean, you know, unfortunately, that's the way our society is developed. Well, having said that, and I agree with you, he's talking about other alternatives. Having said that, why doesn't the building industry in this country build homes with dual piping? Why? Because it's too expensive. It's the same excuse they use, and I, I, man, I, I, again, I don't want to be too accusatory, but that's why the industry, that's why homeowners, which should have a sprinkler system in every house, as far as I'm concerned, they say it's too expensive to put it in. We don't want to build it that way. Uh, as you well know, you go, you go uh, uh, next door in our, in our um, convention center and you talk to the rainwater harvesting people. Absolutely, we should all be rainwater harvesting. Number two, and you know, living out here, it's a little difficult, but I mean, if you live back in Minnesota or most of the country, you get enough rainwater. There's no reason we shouldn't be recovering that. Talk about gray water reuse. I've given many lectures on gray water reuse. It's a tremendous source of water, but the incentive isn't there to use it, to do it. And, and in many cases, the regulators are behind us as far as recognizing the technologies we have to do it. We've got the technologies. There is no such thing, in my opinion, as a contaminated water supply that we cannot clean up. Absolutely not. I challenge anybody to, to give me an example of a contaminated water supply that cannot be cleaned up with um, technologies we have on hand. Now, I, do you want to pay for them? Well, that's another issue. Some of the technologies are very expensive. And this is what I'm segueing into right now, the advanced oxidation processes. One of the things that can be used to treat these PPCPs, to break down the organics, to make them more readily adsorbable by activated carbon or removable by reverse osmosis perhaps are advanced oxidation processes. We've done a little bit of playing with this. They're being used quite frequently in certain applications. Ozone, ozone plus hydrogen peroxide, ozone plus UV. Um, uh, I was talking to Richard Layton uh, before the presentation about the orange water, uh, uh, what they call the groundwater replenishment system. I don't know if anybody's, many of you have heard about it. It's the, it's the poster child today of, of what's called indirect potable reuse. Taking sewage, running it through membrane technology and uh, in particular, ozone plus UV, I believe, as the advanced oxidation process, and putting it down in the aquifer. That is what the people of Orange County are drinking. 800,000 people are drinking this water. It's sewage water that's been treated, and it's the wave of the future. Uh, there is one small facility in Texas that is going direct potable reuse. They're taking it directly from, from the treatment from the sewage treatment plant, treating it with these technologies, and then putting it into the drinking water system directly. Orange County wants it in the aquifer to hold back the seawater intrusion. But at any rate, these are things that, that, that can be used to supplement 
the PPCP issue. The problem is, I don't know of anybody uh, outside of pure UV, I don't know of anybody that's got a, um, that, that manufactures a system that's small enough and inexpensive enough for the homeowner. So this, these are some of the areas under development that, that could help the PPC, uh, PPCP issue. The, right now, I, uh, it's hard to generalize when you're talking about 60 to 80,000 organic chemicals but I say the combination, this, this under-sink RO unit that you can buy um, will probably remove between 60 and 80% of them. Nothing's gonna do 100%. You could probably improve that with the, some of these advanced oxidation, particularly this hydroxyl radical. That is a wonderful uh, unattained goal. I've done a fair amount of work in my experience with trying to generate hydroxyl radicals. You can generate them. The trouble is they last for microseconds and they have no penetration depth in water. Yes, sir. Uh, he's basically saying that, that uh, you're talking about reverse osmosis. Yep. Membranes have to be changed. I could not disagree with you more, respectfully. The reason for that is, in my career, I have never sold these systems. I don't sell anything tangible. But in my career, I probably installed 300 under sink RO units, friends, relatives, etc. Every time I go to somebody's house for dinner or drinks or whatever, I try to bring along my conductivity monitor and monitor the performance of their system. I have, being an engineer, I'm anal about recording stuff. And uh, I take along my conductivity monitor and uh, I, would, I would absolutely insist that the average life for a reverse osmosis membrane, and, and this is assuming that the, the sediment filter is working, and the activated carbon filter is working, the average life for these membranes is 10 years. Absolutely. The, um, I have to be careful about it. The water conditioning dealer will try to tell you, they will get you to, to sign a service contract, and they'll say, we have to change your membrane every six months. That is absolutely BS. You want to know what BS stands for? Probably not. Anyway, it's absolutely untrue. The average life, and I can't tell you, I probably got 30 of these systems that I monitor. I've got one unit, one system in the Netherlands, the membrane has started to fail now. It's down to less than 70% rejection. I've never done anything to that for 20 years. Those membranes will go and go and go. Now, you can't necessarily equate that to a commercial RO system or even a, uh, like, Carlsbad that's got 16,000 membrane elements in there, they have to change those every three to five years. But I would argue with anybody adamantly, you do not have to change these membranes every year. If you do, you got a problem. Your carbon filter isn't working or something. But these membranes will a average 10 year life if you, if you uh, properly pretreat them and, and every system should be properly pretreated. It's part of the design. Yes, sir. Yeah, the, the question is the pre-filtration will ruin the membrane. That's absolutely true. Now, the, the, the issue, of course, is, is doing a good, if, if you've got, and I would argue you probably don't see this in most groundwater supplies. You know, if you've got a lot of iron in your water, you should be treating it anyway. Uh, if you've got a lot of hardness in water, you should be treating it anyway. 
The, the, it's, if you have an under sink unit at home, it's difficult to see how, whether the sediment filter needs to be changed. Because what, the only way you can monitor that is by uh, keeping track of how long it takes for your pressure tank to fill up. Because all of these things, the treated water goes into the pressure tank. If it seems to take a long time, it's time to change the, the sediment filter. Now, over the years, they've become a lot better about using uh, good pretreatment. But if the, pre if the sediment filter is monitored and, and maybe routinely change that every year, and the carbon filter is monitored uh, uh, and, and change that, and carbon is even a little higher, you, it's hard to measure, you know, you can measure chlorine concentration, but, but these RO membranes will even take some chlorine. My rule of thumb is, uh, and, and uh, those of you who've heard me lecture before will, will understand that my mantra is anus protectus. <laughs> and I think that's so important. Make sure that you protect your system as well as possible. But, but uh, yes, the membrane, if the membrane gets fouled with, with sediment or attacked with chlorine, yeah. But th then the problem is up front, not the membrane. Yes, sir. How about the hardness? The hardness will affect the performance of an RO membrane. And the reason why, now, you know, the, 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 as you all know, there are no such thing as a, quote, typical water analysis. There are no two water supplies on this earth that are the same analysis. But if you've got high hardness, high enough so that you want to soften your water, then do it. And use that to protect the, the RO membrane. Because what you'll get is calcium carbonate scaling the membrane. And that will, uh, 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 that will plug it. It won't, it won't attack the membrane, but it will plug the membrane. So, uh, and, and uh, if you live in the Midwest like I do, where everybody, everybody's got a water softener, but a lot of people in their kitchen, they, they use hard water. They bypass the water softener for the kitchen because the, the I guess, uh, very controversial issue as to whether uh, too much sodium in your, in your drinking water is going to uh, cause high blood pressure. That's been largely discounted, but it's a very controversial issue. But a lot of kitchens don't have softened water then I, my admonition is, because these units almost always go in the kitchen, is change your piping or, or change your water softener uh, piping so that it does send soft water to the kitchen. You want, if you've got a water softener in your house, you want to use that as pretreatment for your, your water supply, as pretreatment for your RO. But thanks for all the questions. Anything more before we go on? Okay. Advanced oxidation processes are, are uh, among the relatively undeveloped areas. Um, I have not seen any evidence that UV alone will break down these organics. A certain, uh, uh, certainly uh, a 180 nanometer UV will break down some organics, but the, the normal household uh, UV system doesn't have uh, much of that. So uh, whether, uh, I think you'd have to use to ensure that you're going to get good uh, attack of these organic molecules is use one of these, uh, what they call advanced oxidation processes. But we don't have those for residential applications right now. Um, what the AOPs do is they, they can break the chemical bonds, so they change the chemistry of these PPCPs, and perhaps for more easily treated or at least less harmful compounds. But because you're dealing with as many as 80,000, it's awfully hard to make generalizations on what works and what doesn't. Ozone, which is my favorite oxidant, uh, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, well, anyway, that's my prejudice. Uh, it's the best disinfectant, in my opinion. It will slowly destroy biofilms. It dissipates, and that's one of its advantages. It's, it will not form a disinfection byproduct unless you have bromine in the water, and almost nobody has bromine in drinking water. 
uh, uh, 20 extent. But it'll break down in 20 to 30 minutes and just oxygen. Uh, very little rinsing is required. Uh, you can test it. Uh, CT is, is, the, is the concentration times time. It's a, it's a parameter that's used by the EPA. Uh, and it's a very strong oxidant. The, one of the downsides is anything that's going to disinfect water or break down these organic compounds is a strong oxidant. As a result, you've got handling problems. Uh, you can't use normal PVC with ozone, for example. Uh, and, and the only ozone that, that can work as an adva advanced oxidation technology is one made by corona discharge, which is actually taking uh, high voltage across a dielectric. And this is what happens in, after lightning strikes. You can actually smell the ozone. Uh, but um, it's an unstable colorless gas. It's produced by discharging electricity and dry air then you have to take this ozone gas and dissolve it in, in water. And you can get up to about five parts per million uh, a concentration. But you can use ultraviolet as a disinfectant, but you need to combine it with one of these other technologies like ozone as a, uh, uh, to make it an advanced oxidation technology. And, uh, UV is very commonly used, even residential, um, and it, it, it is used as a disinfectant. To, and you could theoretically use it um, on your drinking water line. After you make uh, RO water, um, let's say between the, the storage tank and the tap, you could put a small UV system. There are companies that do that. And, and it's pretty effective. It's typically a... a a lamp that is, uh, and they have some new LED now lamps that will do a better job than the mercury based, but at any rate, you run the water, uh, this lamp is inside a quartz sleeve, you run the water over the sleeve and run it at the right flow rate and you will get pretty effective disinfection. Uh, this is what it might look like in, in reality. What doesn't work? is for these uh, PCP, PPCPs are chlorine compounds and coagulation flocculation. Yes, sir, in the back. How, how big would that UV system be if you took that picture? You can make, you can buy UV systems that are like this big, uh, household. It's quite an active industry in the, um, and if I were you, if I were completely clueless about it and wanted to find out, I would go to WQA, www.wqa.org. The Water Quality Association is equivalent to NGWA. It's a nonprofit organization of manufacturers and distributors and dealers of, of uh, softeners, reverse osmosis systems, ultraviolet disinfection technology. Uh, so it's equivalent to NGWA. And WQA, Water Quality Association.org. Uh, there is a, a new technology, uh, a new standard, I might say, not technology. It's an NSF an ANSI. As you're probably aware, NSF, National Sanitation Foundation, um, is one of the leaders as far as is generating test protocols. Uh, when I am asked by somebody to say, uh, that says, I want to investigate a new technology. Somebody's been knocking on my door and they have the best thing since sliced bread. Um, and I won't go into all the profanity associated with that. But at any rate, um, uh, one of the admonitions I give to the inquirer is to say, make sure that whatever this technology is, that it has been tested and certified by NSF or another organization that is, that is using the NSF test protocol. NSF is one of the leading, uh, leading uh, nonprofit organizations that writes test protocol and certifies products to, this, to these standards. Excellent. And they have a new standard just for PPCPs called full, uh, uh, NSF ANSI 401. So that's your third party. 
because this industry, particularly the water treatment industry, is full of liars and cheaters. It really is. And, and uh, I, have, I do a lot of writing for uh, one of the trade journals called Water Conditioning and Purification, WCMP. They're listed out there as one of the public publications that's endorsed by uh, NGWA or at least distributed by them. Unfortunately, there are none of the magazines out there, but I wrote a two-part series in uh, October and November for, for uh, w, WCNP uh, on the, uh, some of the, hmm, I have to be careful about the term I use, the, the less than credible technologies that are out there, um, uh, the, the wires wrapped around the pipe that soften it and all that stuff. And uh, I won't get into that in too much detail, other than to say, nothing works. Unfortunately, if you want to soften your water today, the only technology that will work is the old, inefficient, contaminating water softening. It's what's called sodium ion exchange softening. There is one technology out there that is not based on that, uh, but it does all it does is minimize scaling. It doesn't get rid of the gray stains and all the junk and the, the, the uh, uh, stuff around your tub and stuff. You've got really hard water. Your, your only choice today, unfortunately, is um, sodium ion exchange. Nanofiltration will work, but uh, it's, it's not a practical technology for a home application unfortunately. So anyway, um, if you want to know what works, uh, uh, you really have to look for the, and it's for products that, that meet the NSF standards. IATMO, which is another organization, and I met a couple of people from IATMO over in the irrigation uh, conference uh, uh, exposition today. Um, IATMO is another excellent organization, third party, nonprofit organization. They write the plumbing standards that almost all of the states uh, utilize. Very good. And they have, they are preparing a new standard, if I recall rightly, it's 601, but they're preparing a standard for all of this, what should I say, less than credible technology. For, and, and the trouble is the people that manufacture this less than credible technology say theirs is the only one that works. Everybody else's doesn't. So it's hard to get agreement on, but uh, this is just for the uh, scaling efficacy, the, or non-scaling, uh, for testing scaling a water heater, for example, and stuff. But I'm, I'm digressing, I'm sorry. Any questions so far? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's a good question. His point is, what do you do with the, and I like to use the term concentrate instead of reject. But what happens is, you know, this, uh, the, as I said, it's a cross-flow technology. Water flows through the system. A portion of it goes down through the membrane and is purified. The rest goes down the drain. Now, this is, this is called reject, or I like to use the term concentrate, same thing. And so for every gallon of water you make, you may throw away, depending on the size of the system, and I would, I don't, what, do you know what recovery that your system, are you talking about 28,000 gallons a day? Uh, should be higher, actually, but uh, uh, it. 
Okay, well, you know, if you, if you want to talk to me about that, I'm glad to give you some advice. But normally, the recovery, whoever designs a reverse osmosis system, and I give lectures on this. I give a four-hour lecture on how to design an RO system. But normally, the, the recovery is based on, it's, it's, it's defined as the percentage of feed flow that goes through the membrane and is collected as purified water. These um, under sink RO units normally are at about 25% recovery, which means 75% of the water that comes into it is thrown away. Now, you could argue, gosh, you're throwing an awful lot of water away. Every one of these units on the market today has an automatic shutoff valve. So the only time it throws water away is when it's making water. So let's say you use two gallons of water a day. That's your, that's your usage for drinking and culinary purposes. So you throw away six gallons of water. How many toilet flushes is that? You can also argue that that water, and, and, and there are ways to calculate it. That's one of the things I teach. But uh, that water is only about 11% more concentrated than the feed water. That's pretty damn good water. You don't have to throw it away. You can do like my sister does. She collects it and uses it to water her plants. Now, my two cats, they get purified water. But theoretically, they could get the concentrate. Now, having said that, today, with all this concern about water reuse, when I design a system for uh, whether it be a municipality or uh, uh, whatever, like this uh, Indian reservation, uh, one of the first things I do when we're at the design phase is I say, what can you do with the concentrate? And I will tell them, because I can sit at my desk and calculate what the quality of the concentrate is. Um, and of course, if it doesn't contain radium or something of you know, a health concern or arsenic, uh, then I say, what can you use it for? You know, it's going to be this much more concentrated. Can you use it for? for uh, cleaning purposes? Can you use it for washing your trucks? Can you use it for a uh, cooling tower? You know, what can you use it for? That's one of the first questions. In the past, everybody used assumed it went down the drain. But nowadays, you start looking for, for reasonable uses of it. And, and, and you know, that's why I'm glad to talk to you on a one-on-one -on -one basis later about this, because I can maybe give you some suggestions. And, the thing about reverse osmosis is it's, it's pretty complicated technology. But when you finally have gone through it, uh, you, you, uh, it, it becomes very easy to make calculations associated with it. You can make some very easy predictions about the quality of water and uh, perhaps what you can do with it. But th that's a very good consideration, is what do you do with the concentrate? Because you know the, the thing about a water softener, what do you do? You adsorb all of these salts. You're removing something from water, but you're adsorbing it onto a resin. Well, eventually, you've got to take it off. And that's the main problem we have with water softening regeneration. We're contaminating the hell out of our environment with sodium chloride. But it is what it is. Right now, that's the only technology that is, that is economically viable. And, uh, if you use ion exchange, other ion exchange, you still got to regenerate. You still got to get rid of the stuff you've taken out. It doesn't disappear on itself, on its own. It's more predominant with. It's more obvious with RO because you're regenerating. I mean, you're throwing away a, continuously a stream while you're purifying it. But there are lots of things you can do with that stream as long as you put your head around it. We'll talk more about it. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, this is it. Uh, is there any, are there any other questions? I'm going to hang around. I guess I have a delegates meeting at 5.30, is it? I think so. Uh, by the way, I want to thank Rachel Geddes. She's been my point contact. I met her for the first time today, but we have communicated by phone and by email all year long. And she's been a great help. And uh, she's, uh, Rachel is with NGWA and, and, and has been my link to sanity in this. But thank you.
Should I be insulted that there are some people here that, that came because they wanted to get TEU credit? <laughs> anyway, the code here is 12, PC, as in Peter Cartwright, 16. So it's a month and a year with my initials in between. 12, PC, 16. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me turn on my mic again. The code is 12 PC, as in Peter Cartwright, 16. 1, 2, PC, 1, 6. Thank you all for coming. And if anybody wants a business card, whoops, if anybody wants a business card, come and see me. I don't charge.